We are very honored to have the international law community represented at such a high level. With the presence of the President of the United Nations International Residual Mechanism for Criminals, Her, 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 Her Excellency Judge Graciela Gatti Santana. She will introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Leora Bilski. I invite Your Excellency to the stage. Thank you, Ambassador Efrain, for this opportunity. It is a great privilege to be joining each of you on this solemn occasion when the entire world honors the memory of the victims of the Holocaust, including those from the Dutch Jewish community. I listened carefully to Mayor Van Zanen's inspirational words and was moved by the powerful testimony of Mrs. Deborah Marsen Laffer, survivor of Ravenstruck and Bergen Belsen. Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker. Professor Leora Bilski is a leading authority in Holocaust studies and transformative justice. Among her many positions, Professor Bilski is the Ben Gitter Chair in Human Rights and Holocaust Research at the Tel Aviv University Faculty of Law, as well as the director of the Minerva Center for Human Rights. Other aspects of her impressive biography can be found in the booklet we all received today. We will be fortunate to hear Professor Bilski's reflections on Rachel Auerbach and her foundational contributions to the Eichmann trial centered on the promise and importance of pursuing a victim-oriented approach as a component of international justice. In this respect, it is important to appreciate the extent to which victims' roles have evolved and continue to progress in judicial proceedings concerning the gravest crimes against humankind. The cases at Nuremberg and Tokyo were based largely on documentary evidence and, to a lesser degree, on non-victim testimony. It was only after the Eichmann trial at the mechanism's predecessor tribunals for Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia were established and came to rely sometimes extensively on evidence received directly from the victims of heinous crimes. Later, tribunals, most notably the International Criminal Court, have formalized a role for victims to be represented at, participate in, and receive reparations as a consequence of legal proceedings. Increasingly, too, Victims are not only taking part in trials, but are collecting and preserving evidence in real time as crimes are being committed so that they can secure justice for themselves and their communities in the future. Moreover, once justice is rendered, many victims continue to engage themselves in post-litigation matters, such as requests for early release, ready accessibility to archival materials, and combating genocide denial and the glorification of those responsible for the most unspeakable evils. This shows that victims are no longer the passive recipients of justice that they were before Rachel Auerbach's work, but are now active participants and indeed drivers of the entire justice cycle. In other words, victims are no longer denied their own agency. Despite these significant developments, the journey is not over. Professor Bilski has referred, for instance, to be gendered dimension, to the gendered dimension of international criminal justice, including the traditional approach to obtaining and adducing witness testimony before international courts where women's experiences are frequently overlooked and minimized. Redressing this gap demands our continued vigilance and action. This brings me to a separate point that merits special recognition Namely that, and here I quote Professor Bielski, the contribution of women to the development of international criminal, criminal law has been marginalized for many years. And I, end quote. This really may be widely accepted today, but what remains unknown and underappreciated is the full extent to which this marginalization has taken place and the variety of forms in which it has been inflicted. 
Professor Bielski will address us, informed not just by her own experiences as a woman in this field, but perhaps even more remarkably, through the prism of a challenge she does not face personally, being a woman without expert credentials. For Rachel Auerbach was such a person who, after managing to summon the strength to survive the Shoah, was still forced to struggle against the barriers of being not only a woman in the 50s and 60s, but also a woman in that time with less credentials than her male colleagues. That Professor Bielski, with all of her unaccessible qualifications, draws attention to this intersectionality is itself a valuable contribution. This afternoon's main feature will present Rachel Auerbach's innovative process and how she succeeded in ensuring that victims' testimonies have a lasting impact. International criminal justice is not only advanced by the work of judges and legal professionals, it is made possible by the bold women and men who decide to come forward and share their stories. They deserve to be heard and it's our duty to listen. Professor Bielski's most recent publications refers to a newspaper article by Rachel Auerbach, in which she suggested that the Eichmann trial was an opportunity for the living to listen to the silent cry of those who perished in the Shoah. As we gather in the Peace Palace to pay tribute to the memory of the victims of the Holocaust, let us imagine that they are here, silently crying with us. And I now hand the floor over to you our distinguished keynote speaker, Professor Jora Bielski. Honorable Mayor of the City of The Hague, Judge Garcia Gatti Santa, the Minister of Justice, esteemed guest. My talk today is dedicated to recover the memory of the extra and the extraordinary vision of Rachel Oyerbach, in particular, how she revolutionized the concept of victim's testimony in the wake of the Holocaust. Since the 1990s, International criminal law has struggled to find the proper role for victims in mass atrocity trials. It has gradually moved from viewing victims instrumentally as supplying eyewitness testimonies for the prosecution towards recognizing the agency of victims and seeing them as active participants in such trials. In, to, in today's memorial lecture, I would like to return to the forgotten contribution of Rachel Oyerbach, a Jewish-Polish journalist, historian, and Holocaust survivor, and explore her important contribution to the Eichmann trial, where she helped shape a new paradigm of a victim-centered atrocity trial. Oyerbach's vision for the trial, as I shall present in my talk, can be understood as an early precursor of later developments in both international criminal law and more broadly in the field of transitional justice. Oyerbach developed her ideas on victims' testimonies as part of a group of Jewish activists in the Warsaw Ghetto who, under the leadership of historian Immanuel Ringelblum, created a clandestine archive known as the Oineg Shabbos Archive that documented the lives of the, uh, of the Jews in the, in the Warsaw Ghetto. The archive was buried in milk jars in the earth just before the Nazis destroyed the ghetto and sent its inhabitants to the death camps. After the war, Oyerbach, who was one of the three survivors uh, of the archive group, became a central figure in preserving and continuing its legacy. She lobbied, just a minute, I forgot. Yeah. She lobbied uh, to search for the lost archive that was buried under the debris of Warsaw, a fort that led to the eventual discovery of two thirds of the original archive. Then she joined other survivor historians in translating these ideas into a new praxis of victims' testimonies, 
first in the Central Jewish Historical Commission in Poland, and later following her immigration to Israel as the director of the Testimony Collection Department of Yad Vashem. In June 1960, in anticipation of the Eichmann trial, Oerbach gave her first public lecture in Hebrew, in which she presented her novel conception of a victim-centered Holocaust trial. She went on to advise Attorney General Gidon Hausner and the Israeli prosecution, who adopted some of her ideas in the trial. Oerbach herself was invited to give testimony in the trial, but her contribution and legacy have largely been forgotten in Israeli collective memory and did not receive recognition in the annals of international law. In his book on the trial, Attorney General Gidon Hausner takes credit for the revolution in the part played by victims in the Eichmann trial to himself. He dedicates only a few sentences to Oerbach and her role in the Warsaw Ghetto, while acknowledging Oerbach for providing the prosecution with various testimonies of survivors from the collection of her department at Yad Vashem, he paints her contribution to the trial as technical and logistical at best. New historical research has tried to do Oerbach retrospective justice, arguing that it was her initiative to open the trial to the testimonies of Holocaust survivors. Indeed, Already in the first document Oerbach prepared for the trial, dated November 3rd, 1960, she requested to rely on living witnesses and Jewish sources. She feared that the trial will be conducted as an ordinary criminal trial based on incriminating German documents and eyewitnesses who saw Eichmann face to face and could directly inculpate him. In contrast, Oerbach wanted to include survivors' witnesses who, according to her, were in the middle of the horrors of the extermination and who survived nonetheless to tell the story. Historian Sharon Geva explains that Oerbach, um, sorry, that Oerbach's testimony lacked any personal stories of suffering and was focused on cultural activities in the ghetto. She writes, it seems that she had no chance. Given the scant familiarity of the Israeli public with the realities of Jewish life in Poland during the Holocaust, her testimony did not raise any interest, let alone convince the public that these cultural activities should be considered resistance. Her testimony harmed the prosecution as it gave the impression that life was not so bad in Warsaw. Geva maintains that Oerbach had unrealistic expectations of the trial. She, feel, she failed to understand the difference between law and history, between the strict procedures of a criminal trial and a public lecture. I would like to offer a different explanation. The problem, I believe, was not Oerbach's failure to understand the limits of law, but rather her attempt to revolutionize law in a manner that clashed in important ways with the approach adopted by the prosecution. Even though both Hausner and Oerbach shared a conception of the Eichmann trial based on survivors' testimonies, their views on those testimonies and the role they should play in the trial differed. On 24th June 1960, about a month after Eichmann was captured, Oerbach delivered her first public lecture in Hebrew in the Eliyahu Club in Haifa. In her lecture, Oerbach tried to familiarize her Israeli audience with the work of the testimony collection department that she directed at Yad Vashem in order to explain her conception of victim's testimony and how it could be brought to bear on the structure of the Eichmann trial. I will try to reconstruct her ideas from a handwritten document found in her archive that contains an outline of the lecture and from her other writing. 
and I will discuss five themes about the role of the victims in atrocity trials as she envisioned it. So the first theme, Oyerbach wrote, testimony as a central Jewish source as opposed to archival material from German sources, therein lies its historiographical importance. Contrary to the document-centered approach prevailing in the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg, which was wary of the testimony of Jewish victims because of their potential biases and psychological injuries, Oyerbach believed that the Eichmann trial should not be limited to German archival sources. However, a stateless, persecuted group, the Jewish victims did not have their own official archive. Nevertheless, Oyerbach sought Jewish sources and believed that victims' testimonies could supply this missing perspective. Specifically, she saw the opportunity in the Eichmann trial to publicly hear the testimony of Holocaust survivor that she and other victim historians have been collecting since the early post-war. She convinced Hausner and the Israeli prosecution that it was essential to open the trial to survivors' testimonies. However, Hausner's reasons for adopting this approach differed significantly from hers. In his memoir, Hausner wrote, in order to merely secure a conviction, it was obviously enough to let the archives speak. A fraction of them would have sufficed to get Eichmann's sentence 10 times over. But I knew we needed more than a conviction. We needed a living record of a gigantic human and national disaster, though it could never be more than a feeble echo of the real events. Oyerbach also sought to balance German archival documents, including photos and films, with Jewish victims' testimonies, referring to survival testimonies as a living archive. However, unlike Hausner, she did not see the testimonies as merely illustrative, as a way to bring the historical record to life. In her view, survivors' testimonies bore an independent historiographical and legal value since they could reveal what the German documents often concealed, the experience of the crime from the point of view of its victims. And she wrote, but we knew that if there was a factor that could silence these doubts, it would be only the witnesses, and not necessarily those who had seen Eichmann face to face, but the witnesses who had been deep inside the horrors of the extermination and had survived in order to tell. This is one of the reasons why she opposed the legalist approach of the Israeli police, who evaluated survivors' testimonies as potential eyewitnesses according to forensic consideration over their property value in, pro in proving Eichmann's guilt. Second theme, Oerbach uh, wrote, creating historical material whose source is the memory of a living human being not just testimonies, but the collection of existing memory material, eliciting and writing down testimony, prompting, encouraging, and guiding people to write independently, diaries. This quote reveals her attempt to challenge the common notion that testimonies exist in the world ready-made, just waiting to be collected. Obach emphasizes the difficulty by using different verbs to describe the process of collecting them, eliciting, writing down, prompting, encouraging, guiding. Here again, she followed the approach that had begun in Oneg Shabbos, where various methods for eliciting testimonies had been created, such as encouraging ordinary people to write diaries, to join writing contests, and to collect day-to-day -day materials. After the war, the Jewish Historical Commission to which Oyerbach belonged developed these methods and wrote several manuals for collecting testimonies. Oyerbach argued that the high quality of the witnesses whom her department at Yad Vashem recommended to the Eichmann prosecution could be attributed precisely to these meticulous methods of collecting testimonies, and she wrote, 
our witnesses were among the best and most prominent witnesses, not only because they were selected on the basis of material that had been collected for years, but especially because our methods of eliciting testimony had trained them to fulfill this task and helped them extract from the depth of their memory the images and experiences that were buried, buried there. In contrast to the legal approach to testimony that views with suspicion any intervention in the witness testimony, Euerbach insisted that Holocaust testimonies required the inter interviewer to actively encourage the victims to bear witness, given their preference to forget and repress traumatic events. Let me give an example. The early practice of collecting testimonies by the victims themselves from other victims diverged from traditional history writing by professional historians after the fact and from legal practice by policemen after the fact. In her testimony during the Eichmann trial, Euerbach gives the example of how she wrote down the testimony of Yaakov Abraham Kaspitsky, the first Jewish prisoner who had managed to escape from Treblinka to the Warsaw Ghetto after spending 18 days in the death camp. Euerbach interviewed him in the ghetto over a period of several weeks and wrote down his testimony in his own words with her commentary in over 323 pages of notebooks. Kaspitsky was subsequently killed in the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. So if she had not insisted on taking his detailed testimony of Treblinka in real time, in the ghetto, it would have been lost for history. The third theme. Euerbach regarded testifying as an expression of a collective grassroots movement. True to the legacy of the Ringelblum archive, she rejected the traditional distinction between detached history writing and involved political action. Indeed, the archive was part of a broad initiative in the ghetto of self-help, Alain Hilf, which included a network of soup kitchens, refugee centers, house committees, etc. Unlike philanthropy, which brings help from the outside to passive victims, in the ghetto, the grassroots organization began with the agency of victims themselves as part of what Euerbach dubbed passive resistance. And she wrote, just as there is no precedence for the Shoah, so there has never been such a collective, spontaneous, and elemental movement, not in our and not in any other nation or language. All our organized activity is but an instrument in the, active, in the service of this movement. Here lies the secret of our existence. Euerbach herself was recruited by Ringelblum to the archive to write reports about hunger because of her role as the director of a soup kitchen that she ran in the ghetto, which at its peak fed 2,000 Jews a day. According to Samuel Kassov, the kitchen offered her a unique vantage point from which to observe and write the social history of hunger in the ghetto by telling the story of the soup kitchen as a microcosm of human relationship and human choices. In her Eliyahu Club lecture, Euerbach depicts the process of collecting testimonies that began in the ghetto as part of a popular movement rather than the domain of expert jurists or historians. She regards collecting testimonies and history writing as part of a grassroots movement of the people and for the people. She stresses the collective aspects of the enterprise and links it to the Yivo tradition of recruiting hundreds of Zamlers, collectors, for its historiographical project. However, alongside the collective aspects, Euerbach attributed importance to the individual voice of the witness. The Eichmann trial, therefore, provided her with the perfect opportunity to translate her approach to victims' testimonies to a legal setting. In a trial, 
Testimonies are given in the first person voice. Therefore, Oerbach promoted the idea of telling the collective history of the Holocaust through the individual testimonies of around 100 survivors. Oerbach was also unique in her emphasis on the psychological aspects of giving testimony. She had studied psychology at the University of Lviv and in her journalist career often wrote about psychological factor in the behavior of individuals and groups. This background evidently influenced her understanding of survivors' testimony. Indeed, she did not believe that the therapeutic aspects of testimony giving conflicted with a criminal trial, but rather saw them as complementary. Oerbach rejected the prevailing perception of the time that saw forgetting or silence as a way for the Holocaust survivor to the recover. On the contrary, she viewed testimony as part of a process of catharsis, release from a tragic material and regarded the trial, the Eichmann trial, as playing important role in this process. And she wrote in her notes, the psychological aspect, release from tragic content, a psychohygienic popular enterprise, protest and tears. To overcome the tragic content with creative catharsis, with the help of mental effort, to overcome the destruction and death, a kind of renewal of the people, rising above the mass graves. On the one hand, the state, and on the other, the internal renewal from the mental source. However, it should be wrong to understand Oerbach's approach in terms of individual therapy, such as takes place in a private clinic of the psychotherapist. In the quote, she describes the process of recovery or renewal in collective national terms. Oerbach returns here to the original Greek understanding of catharsis as a process of social purification that depends on a public forum and on public speech. Oerbach saw survivors' testimony as part of a collective psychohygienic enterprise. In the margins of the book, of the page, she wrote, in this trial, too, we have to release ourselves from the destructive content and she added at the end of her notes, finally, we have to make productive, constructive rectification by passing on the knowledge of the Holocaust. By understanding testimony in th a therapeutic terms, Oerbach was ahead of her time. As the therapeutic approach to victims' testimonies in the law developed only in the late 1990s, when the new model of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission was developed during South Africa's transition to democracy. But this transform transformation was undertaken outside the setting of a criminal trial. Finally, the role of the Eichmann trial. Oerbach wrote, for us, it is a big thing it releases us from a sense of loneliness. With this point, she refers to what she sees as the most important contribution of the trial. Hausner regarded the trial as a means of giving a voice back to Holocaust survivors by turning them from passive victims into witnesses for the prosecution. Oerbach, in contrast, did not think that the trial was necessary for this, as the victims themselves had already initiated the enterprise of living documentation, of collecting testimonies in the Ringelblum archive project, in the ghetto, and after the war, in the commissions they created, and later in Yad Vashem. Therefore, she believed that the significance of the trial lay elsewhere in its ability to release survivors from a sense of loneliness. The trial could play an important role, not because it transformed silent victims into witnesses, but because it released them from being confined to the bubble of speaking to themselves. In her testimony, <coughs> sorry, sorry. I would like now to turn to Oerbach's own testimony in the Eichmann trial. 
Auerbach planned to testify on the issue of cultural genocide, the deliberate cultural destruction wrought by the Nazis on Jewish Warsaw as part of their attempt to annihilate the Jewish people. Accordingly, she did not perceive herself as an ordinary eyewitness in the trial, nor did she understand her testimony in terms of telling her personal story of pain and suffering. She saw herself as an expert witness about the crime of genocide and about the act of testimony, the Jewish counter response, the agency of victims in finding ways to resist through the act of giving testimonies. By creating an archive and documenting their own destruction, she wanted to explain the link between the new crime and testimony as spiritual resistance. This was not her first testimony. The first attempt to give testimony was in the occasion of the Nuremberg trial where the Polish Jewish uh, jurist, Raphael Lemkin, collected Rachel Oerbach's testimony and tried to convince the Americans to include her testimony in the trial. To Lemkin, uh, Oerbach uh, testified about the meaning of the new crime of genocide. In this testimony, Oerbach described um, the streets of Warsaw's ghetto as a vision of hell. But then, her testimony unexpectedly changes direction. Uh, by the way, I found this uh, um, uh, in her archive, the testimony that she gave him and was never heard in, in uh, Nuremberg. Oerbach turns her attention at this moment to the German cameras that recorded life in the ghetto. And she wrote, and she said, German newspaper men used to come to the ghetto and especially the cemetery and take pho photographs of the piles of corpses. As a, at a given moment, the Germans brought film apparatus and made movies of different scenes of life in the ghetto. In her testimony, she turned herself, that, therefore, into an eyewitness to the German camera in order to reveal the hidden intention of the Nazi filmmakers. And she said, the movies evidentially were intended to humiliate the Jewish population even more in the eyes of the people who would see the movies. Oerbach was aware that in the competition between the German perpetrator and the Jewish victim, the murderer had the final word. Therefore, she wanted to give testimony from the point of view of the voiceless victim. Her move intended to reveal something about the unique nature of the new crime. The Nazis tried to achieve total control, not only over the victim's life, but also over the representation of the crime after their death. By filming the ghetto just before its destruction, the Nazis relied on the objectivity attributed to photographic image in order to present a distorted story of life inside the ghetto. Importantly, they used the victims themselves as actors in the hands of the hidden German director. By testifying to Lemkin uh, about the Nazi camera, Oerbach seems to anticipate the reversal that would occur in the Eichmann trial from the Nuremberg trial. In Nuremberg trial, the Nazi films were preferred over the testimony of the Jewish victims. In the Eichmann trial, the voice of the victims was given priority. The irony was that Oerbach, who promoted this new vision of the trial, failed in her own testimony. Unlike ordinary witnesses, Oerbach wrote her own proposal to the prosecution about the subjects her testimony should cover and kept in her own archive many drafts of her intended testimony. But all her preparation came to naught. Her testimony paled in comparison to her writing and failed to reflect the points she had prepared. In a letter, sorry. In a letter she sent to Hausner, immediately after giving her testimony, she wrote, it pains me in particular, and my conscience is not quiet, 
that I did not manage to tell as I had intended to the story of the spiritual annihilation of the intellectuals. The case of the murder of the intellectuals is of particular significance in the overall balance of biological genocide. I think that Professor Baron touched on this case in his testimony, but did not give concrete data on it. The reference to the prominent Jewish historian Salo Baron is significant. Baron, a professor of Jewish history at Columbia University, was invited to the trial as an expert historian and was the first witness for the prosecution. He was called to present the historical narrative of the Holocaust as a whole, but Baron, like Auerbach, chose to emphasize the cultural aspects of the crime of genocide. Auerbach wanted to continue in the same vein in order to substantiate Baron's thesis by testifying to the cultural destruction of Jewish Warsaw and to the grassroots response of collecting testimonies. Auerbach planned to testify about the Nazi decrees, about the increased increasing hunger and disease, about the self-help organization, and about the various endeavors by the Jews to maintain political and cultural life in the ghetto. In this context, she wanted to present the uniqueness of the archive um, project. However, the message she had wished to impart was not understood. In a confidential letter she sent to Arya Kobovi, then the director of the board of Yad Vashem, Auerbach expressed the shock that her experience in the trial had caused her, and she wrote, I suddenly felt a contraction of my heart muscle until my only thought at that moment was just to step down, to step down as soon as possible, and only not to faint and not to become a subject of a stupid sensation in the press. She blamed the prosecution for its decision to postpone her testimony that was supposed to be the first of the testimonies on the Warsaw Ghetto and to place it after the testimony on the Warsaw Revolt by the heroes of the Warsaw Uprising, Tzivya Luvetkin and Antek Zuckerman, and before the testimony of Adolf Berman on the fate of the children in the ghetto. To try to relate the story of cultural genocide in between these two extremes proved impossible. Notwithstanding her meticulous preparation and many drafts for her testimony, at the trial itself, she testified in broken Hebrew and did not succeed in conveying the unique nature of the activities of the victims in collecting testimonies. I will give you just one example of this. When Auerbach began to describe the self-help activities in the ghetto, she was asked, where the means for the various organizations had come from. In order to prevent any confusion, Auerbach hastened to explain. I wanted to say that this is not the same as with the Judenrat, but she was cut short by the prosecutor who interjected. Who said that it was the same? Later, when asked about Ringelblum's archive project, she tried to explain the connection between relief work and history writing by describing her own work in the soup kitchen. She tried to condense the whole novelty of the archive into a brief description, but without further elaboration, their activities did not sound like a proper conspiracy, let alone resistance. She failed to convey the radical ideas of the archive group about the connection between relief work, documentation, and testimony as part of a spontaneous grassroots movement of the victims. She failed to explain the innovative approach to testimony that this episode was meant to demonstrate. Instead, running a soup kitchen was heard in the trial as the typical philanthropic work of a woman. In conclusion, Hausner saw the central innovation of the Eichmann trial in its ability to give voice to silent victims. He believed that only, that only um, a sovereign state can restore the agency of the victims by opening the trial to their testimonies, and he emphasized physical annihilation and armed resistance. Auerbach shared his understanding of the trial as a symbol of Israel's sovereignty. 
However, she deeply disagreed about his view of victims as passive recipients of justice from the state. She saw the victims' efforts to collect testimonies already in the ghetto as giving birth to the Eichmann trial. In her testimony in the trial, she claimed, I wanted to say that in my opinion, Dr. Ringelblum was the first to start with the writing of the great indictment and there is a direct path from that place in the ghetto to this courtroom. Auerbach's testimony failed for many reasons, but with the disappearance of her testimony from the annals of international law, we also lost sight of the important alternative she promoted. International criminal law still struggles with the questions that preoccupied her. Can we expand the crime of genocide beyond violence and mass murder to encompass cultural genocide? How can we make victims an integral part of atrocities trials without presenting them as passive and helpless? Is erasing the agency of victims the price that has to be paid for conducting a criminal trial? The role of victims in trials of mass atrocities and political violence has greatly changed since their early exclusion from the IMT in Nuremberg. The special tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda in the 1990s relied heavily on victims as eyewitnesses for the prosecution. However, they did not become full participants in the trial. As a result, the historical narrative these trials advance is of victims as passive recipients of international justice. This is especially true of female victims whose testimonies are confined to stories of rape and sexual violence. The Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court adopted a more victim-centered perspective and began to perceive victims whose views and concerns should be given consideration but it still did not recognize them as full parties to the trial. Eurbach's vision was more radical, since she believed that the victims should play a proactive role in atrocity trials, not just as victims who have personal interests in the proceedings, but also as active participants in the indictment and prosecution, including in the choice of witnesses and the definition of the crime. Eubach's vision is also relevant to current debate about the gendered dimensions of international criminal law more generally. Feminist engagement with international criminal law has largely focused on conflict-related sexual violence. Eubach adopted a more holistic understanding of genocide that encompassed its economic, cultural, and physical aspects. This allowed her to turn her attention to the hunger in the ghetto on the one hand and to cultural resistance on the other. Both aspects involved the specificity of women's suffering, but also their agency. Her view of testimony giving and collecting as antidotes to genocide enabled her to depict acts of resistance in which both women and men took place, took part, sorry. Eubach's vision of the Eichmann trial, even though it did not materialize in full, can offer us an important alternative. It allows us to see how an understanding of the crime of genocide that emphasizes its cultural aspects, which were excluded from the Genocide Convention, can be combined with a procedural effort to engage the victims and allow them to become full and equal partners in atrocity trials. This is an important alternative that should be taken into serious consideration. Thank you.